Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Buryana Dincherenko, and today I'd like to present to you a work on language design and implementation for the domain of coding conventions. So coding conventions are widely used in the industry, and the main idea behind them is to preserve code base consistency and hopefully to improve the readability and the maintainability of the code. Typically, coding conventions are expressed in natural language, which makes them a little bit problematic because it means that if we want to detect their violations, we'll have to do that manually. Coding conventions in the domain of CSS are no exception for this rule. Even though CSS is a tiny domain-specific language, um, its popularity has made the community produce a large number of conventions, and they're all expressed in natural language. Now, in the case of CSS, there are a number of existing solutions um, that would assist us in detecting violations. However, most of these solutions have two issues. First, they cover only a limited range of the existing conventions, and second, they're quite rigid. Typically, they would offer a pretty fine set of conventions that the user can enable or disable, but that they cannot accommodate to a custom set of conventions. So with these in mind, we decided to express conventions in the CSS domain in a way that allows us to detect their violations automatically. We did that through designing a domain-specific language. But before I get to this part, there are a couple of important questions that I have to answer. So the first question is, what conventions for CSS exist? So to answer this question, we analyzed a lot of search results, and in total we were able to discover 28 different style guides. It's interesting to note that some of these style guides were actually published by large companies, for example, Google, GitHub, Drupal, WordPress, and Mozilla. In total, those style guides contain 471 conventions. However, due to duplication, since a lot of the style guides actually shared conventions and often even referred to one another, only 143 of those were unique. As we analyzed conventions, we figured that there are four issues uh, understanding them. So for example, some of the conventions were defined so broadly, they were so general that they couldn't be applied in practice. And my favorite example of such an overgeneralization is the convention do not use CSS hacks. Well, of course, of course, the author didn't actually explain what CSS hacks really are. In some cases, the description of the convention would actually contradict with the supporting example. And in those cases, we, we thought that the coding example is the source of truth. And in case there wasn't um, a coding example supporting it, sometimes the description of the convention would remain open for interpretation. In those cases, we cataloged every single interpretation as a different convention. In a very few cases, conventions weren't explicitly stated, but they were rather implied by the meaning, by the wording of another convention. In those cases, of course, we made those conventions explicit. As we further analyzed conventions, we figured they typically fall in three different categories. So the first category contains rules regarding white spacing and limitation in the general layout of the code. For example, where the opening bracket should be. The second category contains conventions that express syntactic preference. Now, it's important to note that conventions in this category do not aim at ensuring CSS validity, but they rather try to choose between syntactic equivalences. So, for example, a very popular convention in from this category is that we always should put the semicolon at the end of the declaration, even though the syntax doesn't actually require that for the last declaration in the block. The third uh, category contains conventions regarding programming style. And those are typically rules that explain how the language should be used in order to achieve a certain goal. The most popular convention from this category is the anti-pattern of using universal selector. It's interesting to know that the first two, when we discover violations in the first two categories, typically do could those could be refactored automatically and fairly easily. However, to address the violations that come from the third category um, is not always trivial. Sometimes this requires more knowledge about other CSS files and the HTML file that is being styled. The second important question that I have to answer is whether engineers are using CSS preprocessors. CSS preprocessors 
extend the syntax to CSS with variables, mixins, nested rules, and whatnot. So there are extended versions of CSS that provide higher constructs that we can use to define our styles, and then they generate CSS. This makes this question very important for establishing the relevance of the study, because it means that if engineers are using CSS preprocessors, they're actually generating CSS. And in this case, conventions for CSS become simply irrelevant. So to answer this question and to see whether CSS is still handcrafted and not generated, we analyzed commits on GitHub for four months. In total, we queried over 2.3 million repositories that were all public, and we were able to discover over 2.2 million commits that maintain any form of CSS. This is including pure CSS and CSS preprocessors. Further analysis show that over 1.3 million of those commits do not contain any preprocessor extensions, and this were considered maintenance of pure CSS. And since that um, amount of commits was more than half of all the discovered maintenance commits, we concluded that even though preprocessors are widely used in the industry, uh, maintenance of pure CSS is still performed, and therefore um, conventions are still relevant. So now that I've answered the two important questions, I'd like to proceed with showing you the domain-specific language. However, in order to provide enough context about the design process of this language, first I have to give you a very brief introduction on ontologies. So what exactly are ontologies? The term originated in a philosophy, and every time it entered a new field of science, a slightly different definition has been proposed. So I'm afraid that currently the term is very ambiguous. However, in computer science, and information science, the term is typically referred to as a dictionary of terms formulated with a canonical syntax and with commonly accepted definitions. The purpose of this dictionary is to serve as a framework of knowledge representation. So in plain words, we can see the ontology as a vocabulary plus the meaning of the vocabulary words. Ontologies typically come in two flavors. So there are top-level ontologies and domain-specific ones. Top-level ontologies are typically very general, they're very broad, and they often borrow concepts from philosophy. They try to deal with the most general categories that we can, I that we can refer to when we try to represent, when we try to describe reality. For example, time, space, identity, or instantiation. The second type of uh, ontologies, the domain-specific ones, extend top-level ontologies in order to create a framework of knowledge representation for a specific domain, for example, medicine or air traffic control or marketing. So how do ontologies help us design a domain-specific language? Well, ontologies can be used to evaluate software annotations, and this process is called ontological analysis. The particular way ontological analysis is performed is that we compare the constructs from the ontology with the constructs from the modeling grammar. Based on this evaluation, we can draw conclusions about the ontological completeness and clarity of the notation. The fundamental premise behind ontological analysis is that any modeling grammar must be able to represent all the things in the real world that might be of interest to the user. Otherwise, the notation is considered incomplete. So to say that a notation is both ontologically complete and clear, there has to be a one-to-one -one mapping between the constructs from the ontology and the modeling grammar. There are four types of deviations from this perfect one-to-one -one mapping. So for example, ontological incompleteness occurs whenever there is construct deficit. It is defined, it, it's actually present when the ontology has a construct that doesn't have a representation in the modeling grammar. Um, ontological clarity is determined by the presence of the other three types of anomalies. For example, Construct redundancy exists when the, ontological, when the ontology has a construct that maps to multiple constructs in the notation, and ontological overload exists in the reverse scenario, in which <coughs> two ontological constructs map to a single on, uh, uh, construct from the notation. Construct excess exists when the modeling notation has a construct that doesn't have a representation in the modeling grammar. So how does ontological analysis help us design a domain-specific language? Ontological analysis is typically performed to evaluate existing notations. 
and in most of the cases, those mutations are widely established, very well established. For example, um, UML. In our case, however, we didn't have a notation to, to evaluate. We wanted to construct a language and we wanted it to be ontologically complete and clear from the very beginning. So what we decided to do is employ a forward iterative language engineering setup exactly as envisioned in the physics of notation methodology. So what we did is we picked a top level ontology and in this case it was the Bunge 1 Weber ontology and we extended it to um, a domain specific ontology. The particular perspective of the domain specific ontology is when an agent is searching in a style sheet for violations of a specific set of um, uh, conventions. Once we had the ontology and all the constructs, we were able to map them to abstract uh, grammatical constructs and then we wrap those in concrete syntax, in concrete textual representations. So whenever we encounter inconsistencies, we made feedback loops. To study the feasibility of the designed language, we created um, a proof of concept consisting of two parts. The first one <coughs> is a standalone Python package, which, uh, which, which is actually supported in Python 3.4. The package offers the command that takes a CSS file and a specification of the conventions, and then it produces the discovered violations. The second part of a proof of concept integrates this functionality into Sublime Text Editor. And also, this is the part of a proof of concept I'd like to make a brief demo on. So essentially what the tool is doing is that it's parsing CSS and then it's trying to discover patterns in the parse tree. So if you think about conventions, typically when we describe conventions, um, we either say, we either describe anti-patterns or we say, if you discover this pattern, please apply these additional constraints. So let's see how those are actually represented in the language. And um, let's try to create a simple style guide containing of, um, a couple of conventions. So let's start with the most popular convention, which is the anti-pattern of using the universal selector. So the construct that we use in the language to describe anti-patterns is forbid. And then we specify the pattern that we don't want to appear. And in this case, it's going to be a very simple um, uh, pattern consisting of one node, which is going to be of type universal. So when I save the file and go back to the sample CSS file, there is a command that I can run to check for violations. And we see that indeed on line seven, we start with the universal selector. The, the patterns, um, so the other type of conventions that we can express <coughs> fall in the other category. For example, let's take the convention that IDs and classes <coughs> must be lowercase. In this case, we have to find a pattern and then apply some additional constraints. So the construct that we have to use is find, and then have to make a variable that says it's going to be either a class or an ID, and then once we discover that, we require that a specific property of the discovered node matches a, sp a specific constraint. And in this case, the word lowercase is the keyword. However, any kind of regular expression could go in there. So if I go back to the, um, to the sample style sheet and run the command, we see that indeed on line 23, we have a class that starts with a capital letter. Not all of the patterns that we find and then we try to discover have to be uh, that simple and consist of only a single node. For example, let's take uh, the case in which we want to have exactly one space between the selector and the opening bracket of a block. In this case, we can say that we're looking for a selector and a block. And we want to make sure that there is exactly one space between the selector and the block. When we run again, we see that on line 11, indeed there is a violation because we have a couple of spaces instead of one. Now this is one of the violations that could be very easily addressed just by removing one of the spaces. When I save the file, we would see that the violation is actually gone. Another thing about um, the language is that once we discover patterns, the constraints that we apply do not necessarily have to be bound to those 
to, to the pattern we discovered, they can actually span across other nodes as well. So for example, to express the convention in which um, every declaration must end up with a semicolon, we have to find a declaration and we have to require that the last child of a declaration has a specific string value. And when we run that once again, we see that on line 28, we are actually missing a semicolon, which can be easily addressed. Now we've, we've designed a very simple um, style guide containing only of uh, four conventions, and we've applied it to a sample CSS. However, let's see what, whether we can apply that to an actual CSS style that has been used in, in real world. And for that purpose, I've downloaded um, a CSS file that is from sleconf.org. And I thought it was going to be fun to see whether this <coughs> file, even though it wasn't created by us, still applies to our um, violates our conventions. So if I run the command, we actually see that there are several violations. For example, here we have an ID with a capital letter, and just for presentation purposes, I'm going to refactor that, assuming that we're also refactoring the underlying HTML. We have double space here, we which we can remove, and we have a missing semicolon. So now when I save the file, probably you won't be able to see that unless you have eagle eye, but in the bottom tray, it's actually telling us that there are no violations in the style sheet. Of course, um, Currently, we've created our own custom style guide, but all of the uh, all of the conventions that are currently supported by the language are already existed. They're expressed, and they're in the language repository. So, if you want to start using directly um, the style guide, for example, of Mozilla, you can just go grab it from there and start using it directly. So, the first part of the point. Uh, the, the first part of the proof of concept was uh, uploaded in the Python package index repository, and I was very happy to see that it was downloaded over 5,000 times during the first month, and it continued to enjoy a steady rate afterwards. So with this, um, I'd like to conclude uh, that the contributions of our work include a catalog of CSS conventions, a study on the usage of preprocessors, also, we exercise ontological analysis to design uh, a domain-specific language for coding conventions, specifically in the domain of CSS, and we created a proof of concept that received um, quite some interest from the CSS community. So with this, I'd like to thank you and ask whether you have any questions.